Welcome yeah, back. Right. And this is uh, the conversation we continue pace here with our panelists. And uh, there are red alerts that uh, has been teased out. Oh. Well, they have been teased out here in the People Daily. Following the deaths in Malindi, inspired by a cult leader, Kenyans can use his preaching as a warning of gospel that could lead the country into another tragedy. Education has no place for God. If you hear anyone talking about this, this will be one of, uh, you know, the red flags that should take you um, and also prick or pick your attention. Thou shall not go to hospital. If you fast without food and water and die, you will directly meet God. Uduma Namba, remember Uduma Namba also had the preachers really condemning it, uh, is a biblical mark of the beast which symbolizes opposition to God. Science and technology is witchcraft. Children should not be exposed to TV cartoons because they are evil. Siblings should intermarry to foster family lineage. And uh, the raising questions regarding uh, also how the state really, did the state officials sleep on the job? That. All telltale signs of Pastor Mackenzie's misdeeds were either ignored or some officers were complicit. And it says also members here of the National Government Administration officers, including regional county, deputy county, assistant county commissioners, chiefs, and assistant chiefs ought to have sniffed out what was happening in 800-acre property that Mackenzie's, Mackenzie owns and which those familiar with the region say is adjacent to a bypass and has elaborate infrastructure, including paved roads and building mm -hmm. buildings. Also, we have uh, we have a story here in October 2019. Benson Mutimba from Mumias Kakamega pleaded with the government to help him get back his four sons who had been brainwashed by Mackenzie. Mutimba <laughs> said his eldest son, uh, Felix Neta, then 23 and a uh, first year student at Kibabi University, was wow. first to be brainwashed before he initiated his siblings, twins, age 13, and last born, age 10. The first time police took action this year was on April 13th. After that was reported, locals also raised down a home of a pastor who worked for Mackenzie at Good in News International to Majengo uh, Wakalin uh, Bungale for allegedly prom promoting extremism. There were reports, there were telltale signs, but too little, too late right now. Well. You know, there's, not, there's no such a thing in our country as uh, resigning in dishonor. Mm. <laughs> no matter what happens, the civil authority stays put. Mm. Tabal, um, it's, a, it's a call these are tragedies, an understatement. And I think that if this thing was an al-Shabaab, this thing was an al-Shabaab, and the guy was called Muhammad, and there was a mosque that was shouting at the top of its lungs there, the intelligence system and the police system would be cr all crawling all over that place. Because Khalif is just next border to Lamu mm. and Somalia. This man, Debal, was, was taken to a police uh, station. Um, there were complaints about it. There's paperwork that was written about it. The entire civil uh, administration did not think about following up on a lead on something that could have saved hundreds of lives. What does that tell you about? It's the lethargy that we have in our civil administration. Mm. We're going to the job, Debal, is uh, just a part-time job because you want to go back to your kiosk and make money. Because the salaries at that place is not enough. Mm. So you don't want to put your energy in there. So Debal, this is just a bubble for the whole country. And every Kenyan knows what's going on. We're all in the take. Each and every one of us in this country know. The traffic policemen on the street, from the cultural uh, worldview that we have about our country, to how we play politics, what we do about corruption. It's a whole national uh, ethos that has now fallen into, not disrepute, but into the pits of Golgotha. And Tabal, I put it to you that uh, um, I think that uh, if the president, and I'm, I know the president will not do this, um, but if the president um, uh, has to do something about this, um, is the ball is to hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. Because the whole process of government is about, is about accountability. Mm -hmm. I think that if no one is held accountable for the breakdown in um, the civil authority on this issue, mm -hmm. um, the ball, uh, this will be the signature for us to say, let's go on to the next tragedy. 
without any kind of complaints. Mm -hmm. And the next tragedy will be bigger. It will be the one like the one in Pipeline where a couple of houses collapse and we lose 10,000 people. And we will continue in this fashion because our urban planning, the ball is now in the pits of corruption. The ball, there, there's something needs to be done about if the, if the papers themselves, which are very conservative in their estimation of this country, are writing editorials about how this country is now gone down the tubes, then the ball, uh, any progressive person in this country who will add to that, has no difficulty in saying that uh, there has to be a complete uh, <coughs> moral assessment of how we do things in our country. Because, uh, as, uh, you know, as the great Malcolm X used to say, the chickens are coming home to roost. And if we don't do this, the generations that are coming... Debal, when I was growing up here in uh, Nairobi, when you, I did not go to private schools, private schools mm. even though my father could afford it. I did not go to private hospitals, even though I could afford it. I did not go to anything private growing up. Mm. Go to the Karen Hospital, the dispensary was full. The nurses were trained, there, there was a doctor there, there was a system in this country, Debal. The system was eaten up during the, the one-party state systems, where, you know, people just went in and destroyed the country. And now, uh, Debal, it has gone into our education, it has gone into our uh, ethos, it has gone into our moralities, it's gone into our private life. Uh, Debal, you know, anything that we do, Debal, is based on some kind of corrupt uh, instinct. So, Debal, I think that there is a moral leadership that's needed in this country. And moral leadership just doesn't come from a church or from a mosque. It comes from individuals, Debal, who beat the pathway, talisman, who say that there's something wrong with this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of the people who have beaten a pathway, uh, people who have said that there's something wrong with our society, have not come from the church or the mosque or the, or the temple. They have been individuals who had something called moral courage, mm -hmm. who have stood up and said no. The direction of my country is wrong. We need to talk about this and we need to do something about it. The one bully pit we have is the president's office or the, the, the person of the president. And uh, I think that uh, Mr. Mr. President Ruto instinctive rungu mentality that capture that guy, let's do something about him. It's not uh, the only thing to do. So we need to ask ourselves as to where did this guy come from? Why is this culture there? Why wasn't this thing found out by our investigative authorities? Mm -hmm. Where was the intelligence system? Where was the police post? When the buying and selling of the land that were people were being buried in, who, did, who was there and who did not report? We have to hold each other accountable. Well, if we cannot hold ourselves uh, accountable, then the whole idea of us being self-government well, is going to be thrown out the window. Because uh, if you have uh, uh, such an expansive uh, geographical you know, acreage of land, uh, that is being bought in Cliffy County, that should be raising eyebrows. Who is this man and why is he buying this huge tract of land for that matter? Uh, is there any legislation that can actually limit also in this country where people, I think it has been broached, where there is a threshold of, of how much land you can own and how did you make in, this in a money? country? How did you make money mm. and how, what is your source of income that you can actually afford 800 mm. acreage of land in Kilifi, in, in, in Kilifi for, for that matter. So, still back to the National Coronas Act, because I think that on that bit you yeah. are raising very serious issues uh, that um, uh, you're saying the way that we're handling the, the crime scene right now is not the wisest of fashion. Uh, multidisciplinary, of course, uh, yeah. initiative will have been uh, taken from before. Uh, we were acting out of emergency, and we needed uh, this. this uh, Kenyans wanted to, or the government wanted to, see, wanted to seem to be actually doing something because of the lethargy that we had actually yeah. been talking about. Yeah. But going back to the National Coroners Act, what really prompted uh, you know, the government or this legislation to come to the fore? First of all, we need to know why we need an, a coroner general. Yeah, uh, and, and if we had a corona, corona officials also <coughs> within the counties, will it have made any difference with what we're actually seeing right now? Uh, thanks, Diba. Remember that um, the entire area of uh, policing reform or security reform was a key component of uh, Agenda 4 uh, after the 2008 uh, post-election violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the National Coroner Service Act, I mean the National Coroner's Office was part of that uh, package mm -hmm. in terms of reforming uh, the National Police Service mm -hmm. where the intention was to separate uh, to, to establish uh, an independent 
death investigation system mm -hmm. away from the police because the, f the police were found culpable in 2008 mm -hmm. of being involved in, uh, you know, executions uh, during the violence. Yeah. And therefore, that triggered then the need or the urgency to uh, separate, uh, you know, investigating the cause of death away from the police. So the police can investigate the circumstances, yes. then an independent office can investigate the cause of death and, and, and provide an independent opinion, uh, expert opinion, uh, to either inquest or to a judicial, uh, any, any other judicial. So that judicial is a matter process. of complicity also from the police. That precisely, yeah, okay. precisely. And so we, uh, from the human rights uh, field, felt strongly that we needed to support uh, the establishment of this particular independent office uh, for to enhance accountability basically and what the national coroner is supposed to do is in case of suspicious death or non-natural deaths uh, they're supposed to come and take over the crime scene the entire crime scene and manage it uh, if for example i am the first responder as a citizen in a particular village or a street and i find a dead body um, and I alert the police. The police are supposed to come in under that particular system and secure the crime scene and alert the coroner who comes in. In many instances, you find that because the first responders, the, or the regular uh, or general duty police officers in, 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 in stations across the country do not have the forensic uh, you know, knowledge or capacity, they will either interfere mm with other evidence uh, apart from the body because you know also uh, a dead body is um, a crime scene itself it's a scene of crime mm. it has a lot of evidence uh, on it not only in terms of uh, what will be found through uh, autopsy but also just examining the body the the uh, the, the position you know the posture uh, in the crime scene is important in many cases the pathologist never gets to see that so a lot of information is lost at the crime scene because all the experts are not there at the crime scene. The police do a good job of taking the body and taking it to the morgue and uh, calling in the, the pathologist mm -hmm. to, do, to do their job in the morgue. If you look at a case of uh, our late f uh, friend and comrade, Willie Kimani and uh, you know, uh, the other two gentlemen who, who we lost, mm -hmm. uh, when the police went to the river, if you remember, Mm -hmm. uh, there was even, uh, I think the first body, they were even removing the, the, the gunny bag, mm -hmm. the nguria that was covering the body. Mm -hmm. That is very crucial information, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. When these people are taken to the morgue, uh, usually the, 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 the morgue attendants remove the clothes, the clothing, before the pathologist comes in. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they throw them away. Mm -hmm. Yet there's critical DNA evidence. From the clothes, yes. Yeah. yes. So, so what we're saying is that the National Coroner Service is going to bring all this together and guide the nation on how, number one, to protect a crime scene, number two, how to collect and preserve evidence. And how so, to do an inquest. So, and how to do a proper inquest. Mm. So that, that's, that's basically why we're saying, mm. let's have one coordinating mechanism, mm. instead of having so many different points of investigation. Mm -hmm. And the police still uh, retain a very key role on the criminal investigation. Of course, of offense. But remember that the National Coroner Service is not only going to uh, support the criminal uh, justice system, it's also uh, for several cases. For example, in a case of mass disaster, let's say a plane uh, crashes and bodies need to be identified and insurance issues are there, the coroner comes in uh, uh, very handy there mm. to provide evidence to either the, the people claiming insurance or the insurance companies to establish the cause of death, the manner of death, uh, well, the police do the, the circumstances mm -hmm. in case there's a criminal. So it's also, it's, it's both for civil and, and, and criminal uh, matters as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a very critical office uh, for this country moving forward, including being the uh, repository of DN, the national DNA database. Because you know we don't have a national DNA database. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And almost every month you see a county government, a public health department, uh, issuing, uh, you know, uh, buying a page in the newspaper, mm -hmm. advertising uh, hardened bodies will be disposing to in 14 days mm -hmm. uh, in a mass grave in one of the, uh, the, the graveyards of uh, the county government. Do you know that when those bodies are disposed of, there's no DNA collected, it's not kept anywhere. So if I come uh, four years later and say my person disappeared, I've looked for them, there's no way I can have closure mm. at all. 
So, so, so also relates to our own uh, national mental health issue, mm -hmm. where people are losing relatives or dear ones, and they never know what happened to them. Mm -hmm. But if we kept a national DNA database, I would come to the database, I give my DNA sample, they try and match it with the national DNA database. Now, if my person had died, then I would be told, yes, your person died, they were buried, I'll have closure, mm -hmm. mentally, I'll have closure, and say, yes, I know they died, so I won't continue looking for them. Mm -hmm. There are people who die looking for their kid forever, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, all, the, all, all their life, never find them, and there are many. Mm -hmm. I have interviewed uh, women who have lost uh, their sons uh, through police action, and they never trace the bodies. Mm -hmm. And they go through, you know, and, and then we have a very uh, unfortunate situation in this country. When you go public about a missing person, and you give your number. There are so many mm -hmm. con men and con women in this country calling you. Mm -hmm. And so you keep on uh, being taken around the country. You be called in Garissa, you saw there's a body here that looks like what you described, come. So you, you Waste go. Waste time. <laughs> oh, the entire country. Mm -hmm. That level of trauma is what we're trying to avoid also through a national DNA database under the National Coronal Service. Uh, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. If, if uh, we uh, yeah, may have just good. come to the issue of, because yeah. uh, still this number is bound to be going up. Yeah. Uh, given what uh, Irungu Hutong was uh, alluding yeah. to, that yeah. we have around 216 or thereabout numbers okay. who are yes. missing. Yeah. And uh, we know this particular cult has been in existence since 2003. Yeah. We don't know when he bought this particular land. Do we have any indication when Shakahola farmland no. was really bought? It's, it's not clear so with, far. It's not clear so yeah. far. Yeah. Are we likely to also uh, get more, because you're saying we needed archaeologists, so to speak, who will really guide? that uh, the numbers could be more if you dial back maybe to the time when how he started uh, this particular yeah. cult the that numbers could be more the, the numbers could be more than yeah. uh, what so we we can get skulls even not just just bodies precisely i think i think, and, I think up to this point we need to support the uh, the dci team by slowing down uh, and Dr. Hashi would tell you. Uh, down, but in, now they in, are constrained in, 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 by the court order. No, they have, they, they in, have 14 days, isn't it? Is well, it 14 to, days? to exhume, uh, to exhume yes. they and can go back and say, look here, the task is becoming a challenge. Mm -hmm. Give us more time. Because look at it. Now they are putting pressure on the pathologist. Mm -hmm. uh, doing an uh, autopsy for 90 bodies in a public morgue that is not properly equipped. Equipped, yeah. Mm -hmm is again traumatizing for the pathologist. So we, you need method here, you need a methodology here. You don't need to rush because you have to, to rush. And, and that's why we, as a country, has, have given ourselves the National Council for Administration of Justice and the Chief Justice, where all the agencies in the criminal justice system come together and have a dialogue. The Inspector General of Police can go to the NCAJ, where he is a member, and they have a discussion about this national tragedy. Mm -hmm. And they guide the magistrates and, uh, and judges who are dealing with the, the particular case. Mm. I, I think at, at, at the policy level, all mm. those guys need to meet and say we have a, situation, a national situation here. Mm -hmm. Let us guide our technical teams on the ground. Let us support them. We can actually halt the exhumations because by exhuming, you're not saving anybody. You see, they can say now in this phase, let us do the search, the entire 800. Mm. Let us deploy more people to do the search and rescue. Because we still believe there are, there are people who are still fasting in those bushes. Mm -hmm. Let us focus on that. Let us allow the pathologist to clear the, the first 90 bodies properly. And then, uh, and then take the next uh, you know, uh, phase of, uh, uh, of, of exhumations. Because already I, I saw the governor of, uh, 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 of Kilifi saying mm -hmm. they are already overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So why take more bodies there? Why don't you stop and, and have a method around it? have a strategy around it. I do believe that uh, that needs to happen at, at the level of the NCAJ, the National Council for Administration of Justice, so that there's no, there's, there's, it's not blaming him. They yeah. sit as policy makers, they have the resources, they have the power, they can discuss and, and guide this country. Are, well, they, are they confined by law, uh, just, if I just come to Irungu Hitton, are they confined by law on, uh, since this is the area of jurisdiction where the crime scene is, uh, we have the motories which are overwhelmed right now, you have that particular no, no, no. dilemma. You're not. No. You, they're not really. There's okay. No. Okay. I mean, I think I think what um, Peter is explaining is that you know you have this. I mean, it's a horrific situation, even just from a. Um, how do you do an investigation of a, of a uh, of a crisis that, that has emerged like this? I mean, you have bodies without identities, and you have identities with no bodies. And that's the 
the dynamics. So the, there are, they need. To, I think what what I'm hearing is you know is that we need we need to see the the state beginning to compartmentalize different mm. processes, mm. so that they, it's not all happening at the same time. So there's a prioritization element, and I think the public responsibility is to continue to remain seized with this issue and make sure that it does not disappear, uh, but it remains a matter of public interest. So we do want to see accountability. Um, we can't be the only country in the world where um, things go wrong and there is no dismissals, there is no uh, resignations, there is no uh, inquiries that take place. I mean, I think at the level of the National Security mm. Advisory Council and even the National Security Council, um, we have to see a conversation that leads to people being held accountable for what has happened. Uh, but I think at the moment, on the ground, there needs to be as much resources as possible devoted. I mean, one of the things I was really concerned about having uh, traveled to Yala about a year ago uh, was the uh, condition and the capacity of the mortuaries and the morgues in that area. Yeah, because I, from what I remember of the Yala uh, mortuary, uh, the morgue, it was very under-resourced. Um, so I think that, that also needs to happen. I mean, I think the other thing is the quality of the forensic investigators, and it's not to uh, indicate that the DCI is not capable of doing this, but mm -hmm. something of this nature requires a whole range of different professionals. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just bone um, uh, and hair tissue that needs to be looked at. They will have to look at soft tissue as well. Um, they will have to look at um, soil and the composition of the soil so they get a sense of how long people have been buried there. I mean, there's a whole um, inter kind of multidisciplinary nature that needs to be implemented, and I'm not sure we have prepared sufficiently as a country for that. Well, the, uh, the whole concept of a secret society is uh, not to be transparent and to keep things under the table and to make sure there is obfuscation of the facts. I suggest to you, Deval, that the state cannot think as a secret society. Mm. Remember, we've had terrorist attacks, people have died and, you know, there was no memory. <coughs> No memorial to them, there's no accountability to them. We have soldiers dying in Somalia every day. The battle has been made a national secret instead of it being an open thing in which we celebrate the heroism of our soldiers. I think the ball that um, this uh, cult um, has also something called the cult of personality. And in our African political culture, the ball, this cult of personality uh, leads to a lot of secrecy, it leads to a lot of secret societies, it leads to a lot of uh, putting a lot of things under the table. Um, that's not um, something healthy for our republic. Um, I think that uh, this incident here uh, in Kilifi is going to be a milestone debate on uh, whether or not this country is going to fundamentally alter course on how we treat uh, the lives of our citizens. Our lives matter, about Kenyan lives matter if I can coin a phrase. And uh, if we see the lives of our citizens and uh, uh, our nation as something expendable, um, then Debal, you know, the, the whole concept of uh, the responsibility to protect um, is going to go topsy-turvy. Debal, I put it to you that um, uh, not only do we need an inquest, not only do we need um, uh, an inquiry, Debal, uh, the government has to set up a commission uh, to talk about two things. One is to implement the ideas that our learned friend on the left there has brought to the table today uh, of the coroners and also develop a national disaster um, institution. Because I foresee develop a lot of disasters in, uh, that are coming. And uh, we don't have the early warning signs of uh, infrastructure disaster, of uh, um, you know, infrastructure of uh, this or that sort. Uh, there used to be a man uh, who was very able called Mr. Dr. Abbas with the Red Cross who has now gone home. I think he's retired. But the, what he was doing in this country, Deval, was giving us early warning in places like Pokot, you know, the government has sent troops to go and put down the Pokot rustlers' rebellion. But it has not sent the National Engineering uh, Army to go and create uh, uh, bridges and uh, help them in this rainy season now that's coming there because there's going to be massive landslides that are coming with the rainy season. So we need a disaster system. Uh, coroners uh, is part of that system in the legal sense of it. But in the national sense of it, we need that um, early warning systems that tells us uh, when the lives of Kenyans are at stake. Lastly, Debal, um, I think that uh, the press has a role to play in something called investigative journalism. You cannot just leave everything to the intelligence and to the government and to the private individuals and the press. 
uh, whistleblowers and people who are in the perimeters. Uh, there's the press uh, has, to nose, has to have a nose to go around to figure out what's going on in the country and report it. And I think that about that we as a nation have to start having, uh, as my friend on the right has said, mm -hmm. a conversation about <coughs> our ethos, mm -hmm. our values, Thank and you. what we want to do in this country. Right. Just in addition to what uh, Hash has said, I, I think the third element to the two that is mentioned is uh, religion. Mm. For us, I think Be before, before we come to religion, uh, yeah. Ambassador, because I think also Hashi has uh, raised a very um, important issue regarding the, pre the, the media. And I remember when I was a young journalist, uh, I wanted actually to do a feature mm. on the kingdom of the cults. And I went and bought a book by uh, Walter Martin. It's mm -hmm. called The Kingdom of the Cults. I bought another book about cults. And it was, I did a thorough research. My first port of call was Freemason. Mm -hmm. I drove in, went to the reception, and I said I wanted to do a story mm -hmm. on the Freemason. So the receptionist just left, and uh, I was waiting for a while. And here comes a, you know, an old white man lumbering my way and first of all he asked me very angrily how did I get there <laughs> how did you how did you come in I said I just drove in uh, you, did, you, didn't club, you didn't climb the, uh, <laughs> the wall <laughs> I didn't climb the wall I just turned it. yeah then I said uh, yeah I'm a journalist and I want to do a feature on Freemasons uh, Kenyans need to know what Freemasons is all about and he was very angry he told me, get out. Mm. Get out. So, so I scampered out of the way from the film. Lesson. I went back to my editor. Mm. And I told, this is a story we, we're still working on. And he told me, stop it. Because religious is a very contentious issue. Mm. And amongst the list of the churches that I wanted to do the feature on, were bound to really spark a lot of debate. Mm. And I reflected and I said, okay, then how then do we show such issues that uh, now we are actually uh, grappling with, where we have all these cults, but people cannot tell the hallmarks of what a cult is since then. We were talking about around 10, 20 years back. Mm -hmm. When we broach the issue of religion that you want to talk about, it, it is a controversy because Every other person, just as you said, interprets either the Quran differently or the Bible differently. Mm. And that's why we have different churches. Mm. So you'll end up telling us all these, other, all these churches that we're in, all of them are cults. Because one has taken a, a, a text and, uh, you know, used that text uh, as, uh, as a pretext, out of context, mm. to create a whole congregation, to create a whole ministry because of one text from the mm -hmm. Bible. Mm -hmm. It became a, a bit controversial. Mm -hmm. So when we venture into religion and you're trying to investigate, who will open the churches for you to be investigated? The Kenyaris of the days, if you are truly, even as watchdogs, uh, sometimes licensing of this media houses, there were times I used, to, I was frustrated. I wanted to call even a media house and say, mm -hmm. what I'm seeing on air is, is pure, you know, indoctrination. But because also these media houses, they want to get the money because the, the televangelists pay huge uh, eye-popping figures as well. They're given the platform. But who actually screens also these particular teachings at the end of the day that we actually beam on air as well? This is where I wanted to really come in, that we cannot really blame the media. Uh, but of course, also, we cannot really say that we, we've done a good enough job in terms of educating the public. We cannot really go and investigate but we can have discussions like this yeah but you know Dibar, there's um i think i had interrupted him can oh, i just so, give oh, you a chance so, so that you can hear no, yeah. okay quiet, no quiet. Yes. but if you want no, no, something of it no no go ahead no, no it's fine go yes. ahead yes. okay yeah go ahead first yeah Dibar, yeah. what you've raised is a complex subject and you mentioned in that uh, discourse that uh, you cannot legislate i mean uh, religion as such that this what you're supposed to believe this is not what you're supposed to believe in i mean this is something that has always been very controversial around the world mm. and it's so complex a matter for us to delve into. Perhaps what the media could do, and here I'm not blaming the media, but it's also at the church pulpits themselves. You know, there was a cartoon 
I think it's yesterday or the day before, which was showing the person's brain is away and it's been uh, taken over by somebody else. I would tell particularly the people, my listeners today, when you read the Bible or the Quran for that matter, it is not a question of just taking a text and uh, use it as, because reading a text and then using it to project a lot of stories is, is so easy. It is so holistic. Read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, see the coherence and how this comes together. Because a lot of these religions, they will go and look at one aspect of a verse and project it and make it a subject of really their religion. And so I think I would tell particularly the people, when you have to choose which church where you believe in, that's your business. But please, if it's going to be Bible based, read through yourself. Don't allow somebody else to interpret for you. Mm -hmm. There used to be a talk here in town saying, oh, if Baba has read it, then I don't need to read <laughs> it. But I think I want to tell people, don't allow that for the Bible. For the Bible, please read it yourself. And God has given us brains to be able to understand. And the Holy Spirit will help you too. But if you allow people to interpret for you, they will take you straight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, go, that goes for any other uh, you know, religious scriptures mm -hmm. for... Yeah. Uh, any other religious uh, mm. persuasion as well. Mm. Kiyama was Before to something. Kiyama takes it, no, let just let one point. No, no, just let, one point. Let, let, let him finish. Okay. Let him finish. Kiyama. No, I, I think my take was that uh, the, the media have a, has a critical role to play. Mm. Uh, and that's why I agree with Ambassador. I think how you tell the story matters a lot. If you look at the journey towards uh, the 2022 general elections, mm. and that's part of where we, where, where, where we are suffering. Mm. Uh, and maybe that's why uh, Shaka Holak, you know, has just gone the way it has gone in the last one year or two years. Um, the government in power rode on the wave of religion, mm -hmm. right? Especially yes. the, the, the evangelical movement. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with the movement. Nothing. So I'm not uh, making a comment on, uh, you know, on, 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 on that. And the media kept on reporting, right? But very uncritically so, what we were facing uh, even, you know, fact-checking. There, there, there was very minimal fact-checking on that wave at, at all. Mm. And here we are now. So we, we were going to heaven. We never went there. We, eight months later, <laughs> we are still asking whether... <laughs> you know. so, so, so the way you tell the story, I think, <laughs> matters, really matters a lot. Mm. Because there are so many facts that were suppressed in the campaigns uh, in the last, uh, you know, two years, 2021, Absolutely. 2022, mm. uh, before we went to the, to the vote. So many facts that were suppressed, including the discussion that you have raised and the important uh, point you've made about regulation. I still strongly believe that institutions that are critical to our ethics and our morals must, be, must face a, a certain level of regulation. Uh, maybe self-regulation. Exactly. I think beyond the statements that I've seen made by the Kenya Catholic uh, Conference of uh, Catholic Bishops mm -hmm. and the NCCK, uh, and maybe uh, I'm hoping the Evangelical Alliance is going to speak. Sit and spoke. And, uh, I think they did uh, yeah? uh, so, speak so, as well. So I, I do believe that they need to take leadership from here. As we continue uh, doing our exhumations and investigating, they should call a national conference on their own. They shouldn't wait for government on this particular question because it puts them in a very negative light. Indeed, uh, you know, you know you, uh, mm -hmm. they have a responsibility to, to this country. They are the religious leaders. They must call a national conversation and lead us into self-regulation that they keep on talking about. Just before you go As a there, starting point. I, I agree with you because uh, the question of regarding also yeah. the National Council of uh, Churches, Evangelical Alliance of Kenya, uh, for, yeah. for the Catholic, Catholic bishops as yeah. well. What is their role? Uh, if we have the religious uh, act, uh, you know, that we have the registration of all these yes. uh, societies. Yeah, societies act. Are they, are they really coming within the remit of NCCK? Who comes within the remit, or the remit of Ev Evangelical Alliance? Who oversees what they're teaching? Or they're just left on their own? Because what is the role of a National Council of Churches? Uh, what is the length and the, uh, the, the, and, and, and the spectrum of yes. who really comes to be yeah. under you know their council at the end of the day these are questions yes. that we need to, because we of need course. to be your, your brother's keeper you need to check some of the doctrines some of the teachings that some of them are spewing in, in the developed countries we have you know a whole association of apologists 
and they have radio calls where people call in mm. uh, asking some of the Bible scholars about teachings of a certain church that I hear so and so is teaching this particular doctrine is it correct and they will expose these people you know mm. some of uh, some of them are very ridiculous doctrines that are being yeah. spewed to the people yeah. but the apologists there they act as watchers of the flock mm -hmm. you know to try and prevent they will bring about uh, people who uh, they're coming with their honest teachings and uh, label them and tell mm -hmm. you know the listeners don't follow this particular doctrine this mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. a wrong doctrine it will mislead you the bad. we have apologists here like Ruben Kigame I mean mm -hmm. he wants to be the president at some point I mean yeah. we don't know why he, he, that but he's He's calling he's an apologist he's really calling out some of uh, he's been calling out some of his I, also religious leaders at some point i think have they also failed at that i think lot? i think the problem about is that uh, you know there's such a thing as uh, freedom of religion but there's also such a thing as uh, freedom from religion mm -hmm. the two are not mutually inclusive mm -hmm. so the thing is about that uh, the evangelical movement of every religion so every religion has this mm. uh, wing called the evangelical movement. And uh, the, ball, the, um, the, the level of toxicity that they spew to society mm. uh, is really now um, very congestive. Mm. The ball, um, when there is uh, poverty and uh, displacement and ignorance and all these things, uh, it's very easy for someone to latch on to these religions very easy for you to look for hope in mosques and church and all these other places. Nobody's saying that there's no hope in a church or in a mosque. I go to a mosque, you go to a church, everybody has his faith denomination. But there's a line in which the faith stops, Deval. And where does it stop? John Stuart Mill said that if you go to a, if you want to describe what liberty is, if you go to a movie hall and you shout fire in the middle of darkness, and there's a stampede. The person who shouted fire is liable for murder in the first degree of all. That is where your freedom ends. The freedom ends where the, 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 the other fellow citizen is getting, is right. getting hurt. Uh, he's being, uh, you know, he, he gets into problems with your, with your speech. There's such a thing as hate speech, about where we draw a line and say, you can't say this about the Jews, or you can't say this about the Somalis, or about the Kikuyu, and so forth and so on. So, Debal, I think that there has to be um, a sense of how, without stepping on the fundamental rights of free speech in our constitution, and our civil and political rights, in which we deal with this religiosity that is really leading many, 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 many people into uh, what has happened here in, um, in, in Kilifi. And I think, Debal, that um, if we don't get a grapple on that, if we don't get uh, a sense of why this is happening, as I said before, I think that, um, I think then it's going to be, um, for an example, Debal, you know, our current president uh, is a very religious person. And I think that's good, that's fine. Everybody you know, has a choice in the matter. But you know, Debal, we're a secular state. The Lord's Prayer is not welcome in Parliament. <laughs> we have a prayer to God, but not the Lord's Prayer, because we're a secular society. You know, can you go read the Quran in the, in the, in the subcommittees in Parliament? Because we're a secular society. Uh, we have a separation of church and state, uh, or the mosque and state. And you know, when the leader of the country is always, uh, you know, on the front lines of the evangelical movement itself, praising the Lord uh, every Sunday, um, you know, that sends a message to the population of this country. What's that message that it sends? It sends that the uh, president is uh, leaning towards a certain faith or the other. So, Debal, I think we have to be very careful, and the leadership of this country has to be very you know, careful, if they understand the word, um, as to how to lead a country and how, what social mores uh, to portray and what uh, uh, their politics should get involved with. And I think this is a, a, a very critical, critical matter. Uh, you have seen the kind of profound uh, problem that uh, uh, Mr. Duale has caused in the, in the, in the, in the Muslim community with the prayer of Mr. the President and the Deputy President, where the Deputy President didn't know what to do and put his head down and was looking at everybody else on the left or on the right. Uh, it took, the Muslim community took that uh, very, very wrong thing that uh, 
uh, Mr. Duale had done. Uh, they were mixing the, the state and religion. And this is one of the things that uh, people have taken hundreds of years to separate. And I think it is very important for us to look into this cult-like uh, societies in this country. Uh, we have to look at the cult of personality that our politicians are dealing with, because that's also a cult. And we have to stop uh, mixing our faiths with our state, the ball, because that is the first sentence in our constitution. It says, we the people. It doesn't say, we the church or Thank we you. the mosque. Ashi was reading my notes because this is what we wanted uh, just to mm -hmm. wind up with mm -hmm. on the political cultism uh, that also is emerging and how you use religion uh, because of gullibility and vulnerability of the population uh, to ride on that particular wave of, of course, uh, gullible or gullibility for you to get a lot of votes. I mean, Hitler used religion uh, to do what he did. Very charismatic, preaching masses, uh, you know, really followed him. But how then do we identify that this is truly a political cultish personality that we should be able should be very careful to separate the issues they're putting on the table and where they're using the religion to push these issues as well briefly even as we're winding up i, mean, I think in the case of shakahola it, it it looks like it smells like it is like walks like uh, it walks like it is a cult um, <laughs> so i think we we don't need to over analyze it i think what we have to do is to uh, look at how is it possible that this was not detected quickly enough, it was not arrested, um, and action was not taken. I think that's the only thing I'm left with in terms of the shakahola, in terms of preventive work for future cases. Um, I mean, it's not long ago that we had the case of the Coptic Church in uh, Kisumu, where yeah. this uh, gentleman by the name of Father John Pesa, uh, um, who was basically... Um, running um, a unprofessional and uh, uh, I mean just a, a terrible operation um, in terms of shackling uh, persons with disabilities um, essentially for money um, so I think there is a space that um, the religious leadership needs to seize quickly um, to block um, people like this from essentially using religion uh, as a cloak for criminal activity mm -hmm. right yes it um, I mean, l let's look at uh, how religion has evolved over time. If you go to the Bible, originally it was intended that it should be a theocracy, meaning the state and the church were actually the priests were superior to even the, the civil people. and. The, the society was regulated that way. I don't know about the Quran, but if you look at yeah, the state of states. the Quran, you see this, the, 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 the spiritual leaders occupying almost an equal mm -hmm. position like that was the civil. Judaism. Yeah, Judaism. Yeah, yeah, now, we moved away from that, and now we went into separation of state and religion. And you have raised a very important question. How do you then, uh, you, you've seen the political class use religion to climb to power and it's not only in Kenya it is so I mean look at for instance I wanted to correct his uh, use of the word uh, evangelical evangelical is not a bad word by the way mm -hmm. evangelical means to spread the message yes and uh, in the US it has also a, sp a specific connotation it means really the, a specific protestantism mm -hmm. that has been supporting particularly the Republican Party mm -hmm. and you saw Trump use it get to power and the rest. Mm -hmm. And many other people have used the religion to get to power. And so we must be careful how we judge those people. I mean, if they believe it and they, they, they're using it, uh, whether the, the only problem then is they use the church to get power. And once they get into power, the state is captured by the church. And you have seen the state captured by the, the church sometimes. And so we must be very careful, even how we move forward and saying, how do we separate the state? And uh, the things like what he's saying, uh, there, there, there's, I've seen societies where a president announced this is a Christian nation, mm. we are not going to allow any other uh, religion. religion. It's, it's ridiculous. That is a disaster. Because then you're getting into a very complicated, you may be seen like you're being evangelical, you, Mm. praising God, but you have get, gotten into a very complicated, especially where there is allowed people to worship as they want. You have animists and the rest. Mm. So I think 
this is an area we must be very careful. The other point I wanted to say, it's also like what we mentioned, journalism should also self-regulate. Perhaps we should ask the churches to go seriously and self-regulate themselves. You always have outliers. I mean, you have in Muslim society these radicals. You have Christians, these radical groups that are, are there. But how do you manage them? It is not going to say, the church will say, people are interpreting the Bible wrongly. The church, the, the state can't have instruments for doing that. It is for the churches themselves to be responsible and be honest and be true to the word. Indeed. All right. The closing uh, comments as well, Peter Kiyama? Closing comment? Yeah, you want to comment? Yeah, just comment then uh, you'll, yeah. you'll also write it with your headline tools. No, you asked how do you recognize, uh, you know, uh, cult leadership and... Um, I think in politics, one of the things that you uh, have no indicators, but one of the things that you, you see uh, globally is when the leader begins to, uh, you know, move away from established institutions mm. and they become the center of focus that, you know, I will give you everything that you want. It's not the institutions. Mm. Then you, be, you get worried. I think that's one of the, you know, the indicators of, uh, you know, a, a leader who begins to, to be cultic in, in nature. So, so even in, 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 in religious uh, spaces, when you begin to see the leader more focused not on Jesus, for example, uh, and, and, uh, and the cross, because it is on the cross that we got salvation, as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's the, 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 the particular group is focused on this particular leader, then you get worried. Mm -hmm. The leader and his wife, or the leader and her husband, then you begin to get worried. Mm -hmm. Because that is not the, the, the route to salvation. <laughs> so you begin to get worried when the focus is on the individual, not on the institution. Yeah. Where if a particular religious institution does not have proper structures of, where, that allows people's participation in various ways and people to exploit their own potential within that particular space, you begin to get worried. And I think we have so many of such, even on TV, who have uh, now TV channels, radio channels, you know, where they are promising um, they'll cure you by, by kicking you in the stomach and you fall down and uh, you are taken to hospital. You know, so th th there needs to be uh, a consciousness among uh, our citizens as to the dangers and the signs that you, 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 know, you need to look out for uh, so that you're not misled. Uh, that's what I would say in terms of that particular uh, d discussion. Right. Mm -hmm. I hope I have a chance to right. give my... Yeah, headline thoughts. Let's just begin uh, headline thoughts with uh, Irungi Hutton as we're closing. So I guess my thoughts are um, not in Kenya. They're in Sudan at this moment. And yes, I yeah. think we've seen... Uh, heavy shelling, indiscriminate mm. bombing of uh, civilians, um, a complete breakdown of the, um, uh, you know, the relationship between the um, uh, RSF and the um, uh, South African, uh, sorry, the uh, Sudanese Defence Forces. I think um, the concern has been really um, echoed by both uh, Blinken, the Secretary of State, and also the um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, our Cabinet Secretary of Foreign Affairs, that there is external interference and that if the, mm. um, uh, I guess, proliferation of warm, uh, weapons and arms to the um, uh, Sudanese uh, fighting factions continues, then this could be a very protracted uh, process. Um, I do hope that the ceasefire can finally hold and allow for safe passage of um, civilians out of the areas that are contested. Um, but, you know, at 300, 300 um, deaths already, it is a, m a massive concern. And I think in our newspapers today, there are lots of indications that it's not just a domestic national crisis, but it's actually a regional crisis and will draw in um, uh, countries as far as Russia, uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia and others. Indeed. I mean, about, uh, just, to, just to add to what my friend was saying, the evangelical movement of all religions, not one particular. Mm -hmm. Evangelical is the noun that describes the evangelism of these faiths. It's not particular to the Christian faith. So I just want to make a proviso about that. My last comment about is that Jesus, Jesus said that I am the way. Jesus Christ was not in a cultish uh, association at all. He came here and he told us which way to go. And if we all follow Jesus' way, we will find salvation. But we will not find salvation about in evangelism. Mm -hmm. We will find it in Jesus' way, alayhi salatu salam. Very impro important prophet in all the faiths. Mm -hmm. uh, so I put it to you, Dabal, that uh, at the end of the day, um, we uh, have a leadership in this country. And the leadership of this country must know that uh, the government is of the people, and it is by the people, 
and it is for the people. It is not for some of the people. It is not by some of the people in this country. It's for everyone. And uh, if the government uh, and its leadership finds its uh, um, way, finds its pathway, it will help this society uh, move away from all these crises that we are going through every day and every month. Thank you. Dibal, um, I was so happy to see in the news yesterday that uh, former President uh, Uru Kenyatta has been appointed to support the peace process in Ethiopia. Uh, and I just wanted to echo what uh, Elongo has said, particularly in the case of Sudan. I was recently in West Africa observing the Nigeria elections, and I was so happy to see uh, leaders in West Africa very well organized, where the former leaders, heads of state and government, come together as a group of uh, uh, West African elders uh, who help in this kind of process. I mean, last week we spent some time talking about how we all watch these things evolve. Mm -hmm. Now it has happened, we're trying to put up fire. But the prevention is the best cure. And so let's have a mechanism that we can be able to prop and support our peace process in the region mm -hmm. so that we don't have to wait until it's broken and then we try to save it. Mm -hmm. The ship has set a sail. It is going to be difficult. It's going to be protracted. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Right. Yeah, my last word, uh, borrowing from that uh, prevention, mm. is to tell uh, my dear Kenyans that um, in a situation we are facing uh, an, an ethical and moral crisis, mm. it is okay to hold your government to account. It is okay to be decent. Mm. It is okay to be alone speaking for the truth. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Peter Kema, I really appreciate uh, Executive Director of Independent Medical Legal Units. Thank you for coming through. Also Executive Director of Amnesty International, uh, Irundi Hutton Kemi. Uh, thank you for coming through as well and, and for your contribution. We want to thank you, the Chair of Africa Capacity Building, Africa Capacity Building Foundation, Ambassador Erasas Muincher, and uh, Governance and Policy Analyst Ahmed Hashi. I think. Uh, Today, we're normally global today, but today is, uh, it's been all local. But it is very important because I think where we are, it's critical uh, as far as this exposure is, uh, is concerned of uh, Shakahola. We dedicate much time of it. I just want to run you by. I know my director is chasing me away. Uh, just quickly, the hotlines that uh, are there, maybe you can take a screenshot, very important. Uh, basic needs watched is a toll-free number. If at all you are feeling <clears throat> you're really out of sorts, you're depressed, uh, basic needs watch toll free, that number is given there. We have Minette counseling as well, the number is given there. Uh, be Frienders, Be Frienders Kenya, uh, is, the number is given there as well, Mind Matters, we have the number there, Kenya Red Cross toll free, the number is given, Child Helpline as well, if you have a baby, you have a daughter, you have a son, and uh, you are caught up in that particular uh, dilemma of how you can actually manage, you know, to help your child also these assistance institutions, Kenyatta National Hospital Youth uh, Psychiatry and Psychology Services as well. They, they will come in handy to help you. OS's clinic is there, Chiroma Land Medical Center as well. Any hospital with a psychologist, a psychiatrist or therapist will really come in handy to help you. I remember truth matters when we really talk about this is just to reveal the truth and uh, it is critical that now as a country we just not really have to never gaze on politics uh, people also are suffering there and in, the, in dire need of hope and they will clutch on anything that looks like hope to them even if they're being duped and uh, of course they are led astray like the situation in Shakahola. Thank you very much for your valid company. Up next is News Diary. Well done.